It's Thursday, March 21st. I'm Matt Harmon. Welcome to the Yahoo Fantasy Football Show. It is a hell of a day to talk ball. Another day of draft season. And joining me to do just that is the one and only, the man himself, Yahoo's own, Charles McDonald. Charles, what's going on, buddy? Not much. I am in Charlotte at my parents' house. So for those of you who are watching, yes, my background looks a lot different than normal because I am not sitting in my apartment in New York. I'm sitting in a basement in the house of North Carolina. Uh, but it's good. It's good. Get to visit the fam, you know, take it a little easy for a couple of weeks before drafts. I think the actual draft gets here and it ramps up. So I'm having a good time. Um, I think I'm having a better time than most of the running backs in this class, which is what we're going to talk about in, this, in today's podcast. Well, yeah, it's good of you to get out of your coastal elite New York bubble, you know, get in with real America down in the yeah. southeast, um, you know, because, hey, this is the not going to be any glitz and glamour here talking about the running backs in this class. That is what we're going to do today. Uh, Charles is here every Thursday helping us preview positions for the NFL draft. We were actually going to do wide receivers, which, of course, is going to be a much more exciting position but i wanted to push those two we're going to do two wide receiver episodes i wanted to push those Ooh. back so that i could get more guys in uh that i so that i can chart more guys get eyes on more guys before i break those down with charles because that obviously is going to be i mean listen wide receiver is going to be a hell of a position in this draft we all know that but charles on the running backs today we're going to jump in and, and preview these guys like we always do you know player by player but I just kind of want to get your sense of this class as a whole. We know that there's no B. John Robinson, Jameer Gibbs type of prospect in this class. So when you think of the overall strength of this running back class this year, what comes to mind? Uh, like, I, I think starting off with there's no B. John Robinson, there's no Jameer Gibbs is a good way to frame it. Like, there's no one size fits all kind of running back where you know, you, you go back and you watch Bijan and Jameer as a rookie, or uh, Jameer Gibbs as a rookie, and you know they're they're good at kind of everything. You know, you run between tackles, outside, catch the ball, run routes. Like they kind of have the ability to do all that, all those things. Uh, I think with this class, you're more looking at like, okay, if I already have, let's say, you know, I, I'm I'm building out a running back room. If I already have like a power back, maybe I can find someone who's a little shifty. If I have a shifty back, maybe I can find a power back. But you probably won't find someone that can do both. Uh, in mm-hmm. this class, there's it's it's like I I would say the running back talent in this class is really specialized. Uh, there are a couple guys who have the size to like take on bigger workloads in the NFL than even they did in college. But still, I I don't think you're looking at a Bijan Robinson or a Jameer Gibbs or some of the other guys that have been really talented uh, coming to the league in the past few years. But there are some quality players. It's just probably not going to be someone that ends up you know factoring into the rookie of the year conversation uh, by the end of the season. And I think that is a good way to sort of tee this conversation off. But at the same time, yeah, I mean, listen, no, no, we're not going to get a lot of rookie of the year candidates here because it's going to be one of these receivers or a quarterback or whatever. But even if you look back at last year's draft class, like if you take Bijan Robinson and Jameer Gibbs off the board, those guys were top 12 picks, both first round guys. The next guy that was drafted was Zach Charbonnet in the second round. Then it goes Kendra Miller, third round, to Jay Spears, third round, Devon Achan, third round, then Tank Bigsby, third round. And then it, like that's it. Then it's a bunch of fourth, fifth round guys in terms of players that were drafted. So I think that's sort of what how I want to frame this discussion, Charles, is like, OK, well, for, especially because we're thinking about who are these guys going to be like in the NFL? Who are they going to be in, in fantasy in their rookie years? Like. There was obviously opportunity for Devon Achan going in the third round to the Dolphins because that was kind of an unsettled depth chart. Like Zach Charbonnet goes in the second round. They have a guy in Kenneth Walker who like is an established player, but can Charbonnet mix in? Kendra Miller, he goes to kind of a crowded depth chart in New Orleans there. Uh, Tank Bigsby, there was opportunity for him, but he didn't live up to being a third round pick. He, he was one of the worst running backs in football last year on like a per touch basis. So I think that's sort of how we have to frame this discussion is. Actually, really, if you again, if you take the two first round guys off the board last year, this class it, is it is it that much worse than the guys that were you know pick three to, at running back to you know ten or whatever? Is it kind of comparable in that range? Yeah, I would say it's comparable. Where you're, it, it it just depends on like team fit and what teams want. Like right when Zach Charbonnet got drafted by the Seahawks, everyone was like, okay, yeah, that that tracks based on everything that we know about the Seahawks, how they've been run for the past, you know, decade, pretty much under Pete Carroll and John Snyder. Um, and I think with, I think 
you know, this class is just all, it's all those guys, like all mm-hmm. guys where a team is probably going to have a pretty specific vision on how they want to use them. In some cases, like, you know, we'll get to Jonathan Brooks for Texas, maybe even redshirting guys for a year to see what happens for them in the long term. It's, it's always interesting, interesting for me, like to look at a running back class like this, because I think history tells us that like one of these guys is probably going to have a pretty damn good rookie year or get off to a fast start in the NFL. But I think what's difficult for me with this class is kind of trying to identify who those guys could be um, moving forward. But I, I, I do think, you know, I, 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 last year when you watched B. John Robinson in college, you know, you kind of look at that and say, oh, you could put him on any offense and he would rake. Uh, yeah. I feel the same way about Jameer Gibbs to a lesser extent. I think he ended up in the perfect situation where he gets to kind of split the split the load with Dave Mon- someone like Dave Montgomery. Um, but even then, still, like Jameer Gibbs is someone who can run between the tackles. He can catch. He, he's got all the skills that you want for a running back. Um, it's just a little bit harder to see, you know, like I said before, the one size fits all type of prospects in this class, which I think is what what people get so excited about when it comes to running back prospects. Yeah, and I think we also know this about the running back position that those guys that end up being big time impact players can come from, you know, anywhere. Not not anywhere necessarily, but we've seen obviously undrafted players go on to uh, go on to become I mean Austin Eckler, right? That you know, there are there are guys that end up being super productive players, um, you know, second round picks, third round picks like that. It really does come down, I mean, especially if you're trying to project these guys for fantasy, it does come down to landing spot, it does come down to opportunity. Cause like, again, yeah, I'm looking back at this list from last year, like you could tell right away that some of these guys were going to struggle to get on the field and like get a ton of carries early. I mean, Charbonnet, Miller, Tajay Spears, like those guys are all behind established starters. Miller was interesting just because we knew um, Alvin Kamara was going to be suspended, but still, like, there's very little chance that Kendra Miller is going to come in there and just be better than Alvin Kamara. Tajay Spears, like zero percent chance he's gonna come in there and unseat Derrick Henry, right? Uh, even Tank Bigsby, like that's a former first round pick in Travis Etienne, but. Weirdly enough, Charles, like we actually have a lot of teams this year where there are some unsettled depth charts or light depth charts. So I think that's what makes our work here today important is like who could fit with the Dallas Cowboys, who could fit with the Chargers, who could fit with the Giants, like how committed are the Raiders to Zamir White? Do they get a guy who's better than him? So that's what's going to be interesting about this class is that the the barrier for entry even if these guys from a talent perspective are behind last year's group, like the barrier for entry to getting early opportunity, I think is actually a little lower than it was last year. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think so too. And especially, you know, if I'm a, uh, if I'm, you know, a a running back prospect after hearing what Jim Harbaugh said about offensive linemen at the owners meetings this weekend, that's where I'm trying (laughs) to go, man, because he, 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 Jim, Jim paraphrasing here, but basically said, you know, the offensive line is the only group, that doesn't need other people to be successful on their own, yeah. you know, which is, I think it's, it's pretty true. You know, I, I think you probably need talented teammates to maximize it, but you know, if you have a perfect, if you have an offensive line that can block like any run play perfectly, you're, you're off to a good start. So I, I like there's, there's some pretty quality landing spots this year. Um, I would also just like off to the side. I think that that comment might uh, give some insight onto what the charges are they get at five. And I think people might be a little upset when they pass on Malik Neighbors <laughs> at five, yeah. Joe Alt or, or someone like that. I, if you want to see the video, I, I did quote tweet it actually, so it's on my timeline uh, for people listening. And I said that. I was like, you're telling me this man's not taking a tackle at five? And it is hilarious. Number one, somebody actually did make a good point. They're like, yeah, I am telling you that. I'm telling you he's going to trade down from five to 11 and take a tackle there. It's like, okay, that you, but you... you same that's thing. in line with my point. Same, same thing. Um, uh, because I have been saying this, and look, like maybe I'm wrong and they take Malik Neighbors at five, but it is funny how you know people crack on Chargers fans, like there's no Chargers fans. Well, tell me what, there there are Chargers fans on Twitter, and they're they're very committed to to the Chargers. So shout out to them. Like, no more Chargers fan jokes because they they do exist on the internet, that's for sure. Yeah, and and they will let you know, like, nope. Nope, smoke screen. They're taking a receiver at five. And for their sake, man, I really hope they do. I hope they're able to come back to that post and tell me that I'm a dumbass for 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 li- li- reading into the tackle stuff, man, because they are dead set committed. And, and it's just funny to me, like, it's the NFL draft, man. Don't get your don't get your hopes tied to one thing because anything can happen. Yeah. I, well, you don't need to tell me about mock drafts because we, we and Nate, <laughs> we had we had LSU fans on our ass about not having Jaden Daniels in the top 10 and going pick 11. So 
you know, very, very normal group of people out there. Yeah. College season or like college fans interacting in draft season. That's when it gets really spicy. So I don't uh, envy you with the mock draft work. But all right, let's jump into this now. Let's talk about these specific running back prospects. And let's talk about Jonathan Brooks, who you mentioned earlier, who, you know, if you look at some lists, like he is the running back one in this class. He's the kind of consensus player that would be the top guy. Um, I know I think Lance Zierlein has him as the top prospect over there on NFL.com. Uh, when you watch Jonathan Brooks, uh, putting aside the fact that there is, you know, you mentioned potential redshirt season, there's an injury situation. He tore his ACL in November. When you see Jonathan Brooks as a player, like wh- where do you kind of translate him at the running back position? Uh, I, I tend to think he's the most talented player in mm-hmm. the class. And I, I, I think he's probably like the most versatile runner, like in terms of just, you know, I, you know, it's probably between like him and Trey Benson from Florida State for me, just in terms of being able to sure. play inside, be able to run outside zone, kind of a little bit of everything, and also have some of like that home run hitting ability. Um, I, I think that he's actually, he's a really talented player. The problem is, you know, you kind of have somewhat of a late season ACL tear, uh, which as we know, that that rehab process is going to hamper where you start next year. And I, I think it's a good goal and probably possible based on the advances we've made on ACL injuries to uh, for him to be back for a training camp. But still, it's hard not to see that affecting his draft you know, status in a way. Because I think when you look at running backs, um, especially guys like on the rookie deals, you're trying to get an impact from them as fast as possible um, right. before things start to get bad with them you know me and my uh friend bryce rossler who works at sports info solutions we have a joke uh basically running back age is measured in carries um so you know frank gore is like three thousand carries years old where saquon barkley might be two thousand carries years old something like that um and i I think that's where you start to get to a point where the rookie contract might be a little muddy that's probably the most important piece for a running back in terms of like the nfl economy nfl cap space health um, I think that that's going to end up hurting him. But man, when you just watch him play before he got hurt, um, I thought that he was, uh, you know, one of one of the more complete running back prospects in the draft. And, and we'll just have to see how much teams value where he is medically versus what he puts on the field. Producer Colin makes a couple good points about Jonathan Brooks. Like Colin, if you have if you listen to the show, you probably know this by now. He's a Cowboys fan, and he has made the point that like he's on Dallas's radar because I believe the Cowboys doctor did his surgery. Um, also makes you a point that he's only got 283 college carries, so there's not as much of that in terms of his carry age. He's pretty young, even though he already comes in with an injury risk, but it's definitely, I mean, even if he, let's say he lands with, with Dallas, like a team that's rife with opportunity. Like Mike Williams said this week, I might be ready by I'll, I'll be ready by week one. I'm iffy for training camp. And Mike Williams is a guy who tore his ACL in, in what, like late September, week three of last year. So, like, I wouldn't just kind of yada yada the fact that he's coming in with an ACL, especially if it's a team like Dallas that drafts him. And then, well, we got Rico Dowdle, who's fine like a competent NFL running back. It's just a lot to rely on that guy, I think, as a rookie. But I'm with you. Like I've did, I've seen a good amount of Jonathan Brooks, like watching this Texas offense, which not fun, not one of my favorite offenses to watch. Um, the receivers are interesting, but I, I will tell you, man. Like a couple times while watching Xavier Worthy, I'm like, this running back's more interesting. Like a, a couple times, like watching the receivers, I'm like, Jonathan Brooks can absolutely play. Um, and they put a lot on, you know, because they do a lot of RPOs and screens and stuff like that. They put a lot on his plate too. Like he looks like a running back that can handle not just a lot of carries, but also just like the mental part of the position. Yeah. I, I and, and look, I think it can only help playing for a head coach like Steve Sarkeesian, who has a track record of, you know, coaching in the NFL, putting players into the NFL basically over the past like 20 years of college football. Um, so, you know, I, I think he'll probably be prepared in, in some ways. And I, I really do think if he was healthy, he might be the unquestioned RB1. But, yeah, you know, you still, you still just have to see what it looks like when he when he comes back and, and is able to actually uh, to play and get healthy and get used to the NFL. Because I, I think when you're talking about, okay, I can be ready by training camp. I think there's a big difference just in terms of I can be ready by training camp to actually start. And, oh, I've been working out with the team all summer since the second I got drafted. And now I'm kind of ready to, I already know what's going on. I know what's expected of me. I know how right. I feel. Um, you know, you just got to give them a chance to get off the ground a little bit. 
I feel like with this running back class, it's just identifying when is that run going to happen, you know, because I think I don't think any of these guys are they're definitely not going in the first round. And most people don't even think there's going to be like a top 50 pick at this position. I think you're starting to look at like Dallas at 56, you know, um, I think that's kind of like where you'd start to th- where you start to think about it. Like there may be Miami at 55, although I doubt that because they have most are coming off a productive season. They have Devon Achan, even if he's not let me like a feature type runner. Um, and then you're looking at like the top of the third round. That's when you're like pick 69, the Chargers. So I feel like once these running backs start coming off the board, Charles, like they'll start going like there will be that run on them because there are quality players here. But it's just. Is somebody is, is the team going to start that run with Jonathan Brooks because of the medical questions? I'm with you that I think if he was clean medically, I think he might be, uh, a, again, maybe not a first round pick, but early second rounder. Maybe some team that wants like you know, just needs an inflection of juice at that position. Maybe a Carolina, even at 39. Like, I don't know how happy they are with their running back room. But because of that, like there, there's no way that's happening at this point uh, just because of the medical red flags. And, and I wonder if he ends up being the guy that starts that run because of that. Yeah, I if I had to if I had to place a bet on which running back kicks off the run, it's probably like Trey Benson or Blake Corum. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, just in terms of like from chatting with from with NFL people and and kind of watching the the tape and asking like you know other people in the media like what they think of these running backs. So I I I almost feel like Jonathan Brooks has probably ended up to be a steal more so than someone who kicks off the run because. Like I said before, the most important thing for a rookie running back is that you can play today. Um, yeah. And I'm not sure that that's true for him just yet. But, dude, if he gets healthy, I would be stunned if he doesn't have a pretty productive career for, you know, as long as his body will allow him to take car crashes every single game. Right. Clearly a very, very good back, I think, with a multi-layer skill set. Like a, a very good modern NFL back. It's just... When is he going to be ready? And and like you said, that teams want to get a lot out of this running back position on the first contract and, and really in these first couple of seasons. So that does raise red flag. But let's talk about Trey Benson next, who, um, yeah, I think makes a lot of sense with what you're saying as a guy that could be the first one to kick off the, the run here. Some people clearly have him as a top running back prospect in this class. Guys, pretty pretty good size, you know, six foot two sixteen, uh, four three nine in the 40. I mean, you know, so there's something here. With him, I believe he has the tie, the highest score in terms of running backs for next gen stats. That's like production profile, athleticism, everything there. So, um, where are you at with Trey Benson as a player? Oh, he's awesome. Uh, really? Okay, I think he's awesome. Well, but I also like the flashy things. Like I get sure, I get you know kind of caught up in oh well. Here's this you know two hundred fifteen, two hundred twenty pound back with four three speed. Hey, that that usually plays in the NFL, but. I think mm-hmm. you also ask, have to ask yourself the question, well, then why wouldn't he be considered like a true first round pick? Um, I, I think when you watch Benson, the the one thing that kind of uh, strikes out to me as like this kind of causes concern is he's more like a linear athlete than someone who can really make, you know, someone misses in, you know, side to side. And, and you know, it's some of the things that like made B. John Robinson and Jameer Gibbs uh, right, outstanding yeah. prospects where, you know, you could be in a phone booth and next thing you know, you're, you're grabbing air trying to tackle them because uh, they've got away from you. I don't think that that's really Trey Benson's game, but you know, if you can, if you can give him a bit of a runway and just say, Hey, we're, we're going to be a team like, you know, the Eagles back in the day, and we're going to be able to open up holes on inside zone and in the a gap and the B gap. If we can just give you a little crease, you should be a player that can be able to get up the field and, and get explosive. But I do think that, as far as other ways to get him the ball, you might have to be a little bit more creative because, like, he's not the most flexible guy. But, man, it, it, it's just hard to find, even in straight line speed, like, guys who are that size that can run, like, a real 4-3. So um, I think that he's, like, if, if I was drafting for this class, I think he would probably be the running back that i go after just because, you know, he's healthy, Um He's got the size, he's got the speed, but you know, maybe not the most shifty guy in the world, which is still like that's that's not the worst thing because I think, you know, he's one of the guys that I think of when we started off the podcast by saying, Hey, there might not be one size fit all guys, but if you have, you know, little bits and pieces of a running back room, there's a lot of great hole there's a lot of guys that can uh, plug some holes in a pretty big way, and I think he's one of them. 
because yeah, he definitely has the size and I think the skill set. I'm with you, like a linear skill set to be an early down banger, to be a guy that you can give. He doesn't. He didn't have a t- like. He didn't have a ton of games where he had a ton of carries, but he has a wide college resume. So I think you can feel pretty good about giving him the ball, you know, 15, 16, 17 times on the ground. But he also is a pretty capable receiver. I would say that about him. Like when I when I watch him play, when I watch Florida State's offense, like he he's a guy like you're not giving him design targets necessarily, but like getting him, you know, little flat routes out of the backfield, like hitting him on wheel routes and stuff like that. I think he can do that. So I think is it fair to say that maybe he's not a home run necessarily? Like I think maybe Jonathan Brooks, like you could strike out or you could hit a home run just because of the the injury versus the skill set. But with Trey Benson, like you probably can hit a double. Mm -hmm. You might, you might hit a triple, but like, that's kind of the range you're looking at with him. Yeah. Like if I was, uh, man, I'm I'm trying to think like what team would be a nice fit for him uh, specifically. I mean, the the chiefs to me, because you got, you got the interior, You've got because you got what Trey Trey Smith, Creed Humphrey, Joe Thune on the interior. Those guys are people movers. Um, and then beyond that, you know, it, all he has to do is just get to the second level, and he's kind of a nightmare. Um, and I I also think that he would be kind of a nice pairing with Pacheco, where you got two guys who are you know tough runners, but where Pacheco might be a little shiftier and. Maybe that's like uh, someone you can use in short yardage spaces. I think Benson can be um, a home run hitter that that offense really desperately needs. Uh, because as it's, it's, it feels safe to say, weird to say the Chiefs need anything because they just won the Super Bowl with like right. Kadarius Tony getting real snaps for them during the season. Um, but uh, you know they do need some juice and some explosiveness. I think that's the one thing you can guarantee that Trey Benson is going to bring to the NFL. Might not be the most consistent runner you've seen, but Anyone that can hit, you know, a 50 yard, 60 yard run at any point is someone that should be covered in the draft. Yeah, there he's definitely an interesting guy to project. Um, and someone that I could see like, hey, the Giants at 47, they need a running back. Like they're they're I just can't imagine that they're gonna walk into the season with Devin Singletary and the rest of the depth chart there. Like I think they're taken aback at some point. Um, I don't know if like that gets my juices flowing. Um, like Trey Benson landing with the Giants offense, but Something that again at pick forty seven, kind of in that range, like maybe the Raiders, right? Like I, I don't know. The Raiders are interesting. I, I really wonder how committed they are to Zamir White because they've sounded like they're committed to Zamir White. Um, and maybe I'm just like infatuated with the guy's arms because I mean that dude is is. Have you seen Zamir White's arms lately, man? Oh guy's yeah, Jack, Jack. Guys, yeah, he's he's Jack. So I don't know if I, that's just in my head. Like maybe they just roll with Zamir White, but I don't know. Interesting. That would be an interesting fit too. Yeah, I'm a. I, I'm I'm really interested to see like what teams feel like they need, um, you know, because I, I I always think that the off season and the draft is one of the only times where teams are actually honest with you about what they feel like they need. So, um, yeah, I, I think Zamir Wright, Zamir White, like plus another guy is probably good enough backfield, uh, and it, you know just to see like what the Raiders decide that they want um, in the draft because I do think that walking into the season with Zamir White as like your unquestioned RB one probably not a great situation uh but yeah there there's it's like trey benson would be a good fit and we'll get to some of the other guys i just think that a like specialized skill is like at the premium in this class and that's where teams are going to tell you what they actually feel like they need for their offense all right people that watch college football are familiar with blake quorum you know five eight two oh five uh, Marshall, Virginia, shout out, a uh, senior pro- prospect is Blake Corum. Again, played for a big, <laughs> what are you shaking your head at me for? Marshall, <laughs> Virginia. What the hell is that? That's where he's from, man. Is that where you're from? No, I'm okay. just, in, I'm just, <laughs> shut Virginia's up. I a like big to, state. We don't need yeah, to shout out like, all of Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know where Marshall, Virginia is actually. I'd have, I would have to Google it. <laughs> This is, this is one of my few bits, Charles. Okay, so yeah, let me have I, it. So again, see, I just ate my ass in Nova, and don't go any further, really. <laughs> I mean, dude, you got to get out of Nova. Give me a break. There's some. There's yeah. some much better. Yeah, stuff well, that's why this. I go to Maryland. Okay. Anyways, let's not <laughs> let's not get into let's not get into the Virginia geography conversation here. Blake Corum, again, a player that people are familiar with by now. Obviously, um, you know, again, played for a big program. Everybody wants to make the connection. Blake Corum to the Chargers. Talk about a team that has explicitly said they want to remake their running back room. They signed Gus Edwards. Um, they are meeting with J.K. Dobbins. So is, is it just going to be like everybody that Greg Roman and Jim Harbaugh knows? Uh, maybe. But talk to me about Blake Corum's game here a little bit. 
Well, first, it could be because look at Jim Harbaugh's staff. It's just all guys that he knows. Just Michigan guys True. and Greg, Greg Roman. Uh, <laughs> well, it's Michigan guys, Greg Roman. GM, and GM a former front office guy from the Ravens. The Ravens, his, right. His brother, yeah. He's not looking too far for guys that no. are going to be um, on his staff. But, you know, I, I think Blake Horn makes a lot of sense. Honestly, I think the Chargers are kind of in a place where any running back makes sense. Um because they're so thin. I know they have Gus Edwards and Eckler's gone. Um, but still, like Gus Edwards is a very particular type of running back. He's going to run you the hell over. And there might not be too much else besides that. But with Blake, Blake is so Blake is so interesting to me because he's the kind of guy that I love watching on Saturdays. Mm. That I have questions about like where he fits on an NFL roster. Because... He's not the fastest guy. He's not the most explosive guy. But he's just a good damn running back. You know, like, right. I, I think what what makes me so excited about, like, watching him and what's fun about watching him is, like, when you're, when, when we talk about football, sometimes the internet, we talk about, like, the idea of teach tape and what would be a productive, you know, if I was going to show this to a bunch of high schoolers and say, hey, this is how you run counter. This is how you run power. This is how you run inside zone. I would probably be pulling a bunch of Blake Horn clips because to me, they would be the most repeatable for, um, you know, if I was teaching it to a bunch of kids who try and play running back, his tape is like the most repeatable to me as far as trying to learn the position. But that to me also doesn't bode too well for the NFL. If I'm looking at your tape and saying, hey, with enough work, maybe, you know, a lesser talented high school player could learn the game, learn to play the game the same way that you do. Um, but man, he's just so technically talented. The, the mm-hmm. vision, the footwork, the ability to set defenders up and figure out where they're going. I, I do think that there's um, there's a spot for him to be a productive NFL player, but I don't know if he's going to be you know, someone that ends up being a huge source of production because he doesn't really have the top-end physical skills. Uh, maybe, maybe his max might be someone like Austin Eckler. Where hmm. you're you you have like a, a pretty good peak where you're you know an integral part of a good offense, but maybe not like the most you know RB one type of running back uh, in the league. I, I I think that when you start talking to NFL people, they're pretty high on Blake Corum, so I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up being the first running back off the board. Um, but I you know I still have some questions on where his skill set translate that would make him like this dominant, you know, running back one type of player. Yeah, he feels very landing spot dependent, very like offensive line dependent. I mean, to to quote Jim Harbaugh, right? Like we're talking about that's you're gonna need a you're gonna need a good offensive line uh to get production out of the running back. Blake Corm definitely feels like that guy. When you're talking about like a technically sound player, um, and, and I agree with you, very technically sound, good vision, the whole thing, like knows how to set those runs up, knows how to like let lanes develop and then hit it. Sort of feels like David Montgomery ish to me. Um, he's not maybe like the tackle break. Like David Montgomery's always had these like crazy tackle breaking stats and stuff like that. Maybe Blake Corm's not necessarily that guy. I know like some of the after contact metrics aren't super, super kind to him, I'm pretty sure. But he's also much smaller than David Montgomery, too. He's like 5'8, 205. Dave Montgomery's 5'11, over 220. At least he list- he's listed as that right now. So I don't know if like smaller. David Montgomery gets people juiced up, but at the same time, you see like how productive and efficient David Montgomery can be when he's in the right ecosystem at the right offense behind the right offensive line. And I feel like there's a scenario where if Blake Corm gets drafted by a team like that, we could be pretty excited. Yeah. Um, can I detour for just a quick second? Because when we were talking about Jim Harbaugh and some of the offensive line quotes made me look up like the Super Bowl roster where they lost the Ravens uh, in 2012. Do you know how many wide receivers were on this roster by the end of the season? I mean, wasn't Randy Moss on that roster? He was one of them. Yeah. I'm trying to think who else. Like, Randy Moss, Anquan Bolden, Michael Crabtree was not there. You know, he wasn't. Crabtree was there, though, right? Crabtree was there. Randy Moss was there. They had four wide receivers on this (laughs) roster. Four. Who are the other two? Randy Moss, who was super washed. Michael Crabtree. Ted Ginn. And AJ Jenkins. <laughs> AJ making... Jenkins, I think, was the the last time Trent Balky's drafted a receiver on in the first like two rounds. I think, and probably why he hasn't drafted another one. <laughs> yes, 
But it, but he made the Super Bowl with this roster. They're not taking a wide receiver at four or at five. I'm sorry, it's just not happening. Not yeah, happening. I mean that that that's post Titans, Randy Moss to you people like that. <laughs> post, he could post. They, they post had they really they really had one receiver on the roster. If we're going to be or maybe two, I might give you Ted, but AJ Jenkins was not anything, and Michael Crabtree was Michael Crabtree. So if if Jim can make the Super Bowl with that roster, there might be a spot for Blake Corum to come in and be. Like the you know one of the running backs in this roster, they had they did have five running backs though, five running backs, four wide receivers. Super Bowl team, baby, re become. Well, yeah, I mean, good luck, man. That is that is pretty outrageous. <laughs> it's I mean, a I'm good looking bit, at it now. though. Wait, wasn't wasn't Mario Manningham on that team? This is the final roster that played the final that- roster on the Super Bowl. Right, 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 right. Yeah, because he did have. He had forty uh, two. He had forty two catches. The second leading receiver on that team, forty two catches. Mario Manningham. That there season, we go. perfect. It's amazing. Wow. So okay, get get excited, Chargers fans. Uh, I I know people Blake are already Corum. freaking out about the Jim Gar- Jim Harbaugh. Not stuff. only are they going to draft Blake Corum, they're going to draft Jonathan Brooks, Trey Benson, Bucky Irving, Marshawn Lloyd. Basically, this entire podcast. And and, and Justin Herbert's going to be flinging. Uh, a very efficient deep shots to jo- Josh Palmer. So get ready. Josh Palmer is going to be their Michael Crabtree. <laughs> Good luck. Um, okay. Yeah. But seriously, I do think Blake Corum is a guy that if he gets drafted to the right spot, is, it, is the Chargers really that spot? I'm not sure. If he ended up in Dallas, I actually think I'd be pretty excited about that just because it's a good offensive line a good rushing ecosystem but he's definitely a guy that like from a dynasty perspective depending on the landing spot and whether this is right or wrong i could see him getting boosted up because like charles and i are saying this is a player that should hit the nfl from day one and be able to like be able to swim be able to tread water a little bit at the running back position yeah and you know i don't know what would happen on like second contract stuff but that's so far away it's not really what we're talking about i i I, like he Quorum is a, is a day one impact guy to me, but probably more of a committee guy than a lead off back. Uh, just to close one last loop here, Marshall, Virginia is between Manassas and uh, like Shenandoah State Park. So okay. actually, pretty, I do know where Shenandoah pretty, is. Yeah, pretty. I mean, I grew up right by Manassas, so I mean, I'm from Dumfries, Dumfries, VA, baby, right here. So that's actually not that far. I should have known where Marshall, Virginia is. I know podcast listeners were very excited for me to close that particular loop there. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about Bucky Irving out of Oregon, another player I've seen a little bit of here. He reminds me of Devin Singletary, where if you were not slow, you might be the best running back in the league. Like that's yeah. <laughs> well, because I mean, Devin Singletary, he's uh, and I feel the same way about Bucky Irving. You know, you watch him play. He's making people miss. He's a technically sound runner between the tackles, even with a smaller frame. And he gets mm-hmm. to the second level and just nothing happens. You know, yeah, like yeah, yeah. you're. But I mean, look, if, if you're even, even someone with that baseline skill is probably worth, you know, a third or fourth round pick at the end of the day. So I think that, you know, he's got he's got a lot of talent as far as just being a productive player, but he's missing the one thing that actually pushes him into the land of being like a truly dynamic back. He ran a four five five at five nine, 192 pounds, which is, you know, kind of where where we land on on his physical attributes. But man, you just gotta watch him play. Um he's a really talented guy. Uh, he was a huge, huge uh, positive impact in the Oregon success on offense last year. Um, it's really just a lack of top end speed that has me concerned about Bucky. But there are a lot of players like that uh, in the NFL. You know, more than just Devin Singletary. Um, not any that come to mind specifically right now. But still, you know, uh, we've all seen all these guys because they're not. It's not a rare body type that he has. You know, five nine, one ninety five mm-hmm. to two hundred. Not all that fast, but shifty. You can find a lot of guys like that, but still, Bucky's one of those guys, and I think that uh, um, he's like the perfect committee back. You probably don't want to give him 300 touches, but a nice little 150 to 200 is probably pretty good for your team. I mean, Devin Singletary was drafted 74th overall uh, in the third round, so like that's actually – it's there's a, at least precedent of a guy like this going in day two, late day two in the draft. So I, that makes a lot of sense to me. And, you know, it's funny, like you, that Devin Singletary comp is actually, I think, really good um, and sort of a guy that like I could I could see him being sort of in a Devin Singletary type of role where if for a zone running team like Houston was last year, like, hey, we're going to set these runs up. And as long as you can just get us 
four yards when it's blocked for four, we're going to be okay with that. Right. Because like Damian Pierce last year fell out of favor with that because he was more of like a home run hitter. Now, he's definitely more of like, let's get him in man gap situations and give him a lane and let him break tackles. And it's much flashier like guys. I think like Bucky Irving and guys like uh, Devin Singletary, they're not the flashiest players are definitely not going to. I mean, we were talking about Blake Corm and like maybe that's a little boring, but it's like kind of teach tape. I wouldn't say Bucky Irving is like that, but. Again, somebody that could just get the job done, execute like a zone blocking scheme. So um, there are definitely plenty of teams right now that need a guy like that. That's just going to just going to hit you some singles here and there. I mean, Devin Singletary just got a three year contract uh, out there in free agency. So it's definitely possible that teams like a guy like this. Yeah, I, I, I would be fine drafting Bucky Irving if I had another running back already on the roster. Or maybe if you don't like I, I thought what the Packers did. Last year was pretty interesting in how they built out their tight end room in the draft by drafting hmm. um, Tucker Craft and uh, Luke Musgrave. Luke Musgrave, whose yeah. name I definitely remembered. Um, and I think you could kind of do that with this running back class. Like, say, you know, if I were to draft a, a Trey Benson and a Bucky Irving, I would feel pretty good about my running back room by the time I came out of the draft. So maybe that's what you can do here. But, you know, I don't think that if you're walking into a situation with Bucky where he's probably going to be your RB1, I don't think that that's a good time for anyone. And I think we've seen that (laughs) with Devin Singletary in the NFL when the Bills were like, oh, we still need to go out and get like a James Cook or uh, someone like that. But that to me is not really a slight. It's just more about where you are. Yeah, I will say too, not my favorite pass protector in the world, like watching uh, Oregon's offense. Like, I feel actually pretty good about Bo Nix creating, but I feel like he had to be a creative passer at times, like, or, you know, run around and do stuff because of pass protection issues. And some of that was uh, Bucky Irving. So uh, there is that. All right, let's talk about Marshawn Lloyd here. Um, there are some. I have noticed there are some big time Marshawn Lloyd truthers out there uh, as like a guy that's going to go in the third round, fourth round and really end up becoming like a high quality back in the NFL. Where do you stand on Marshawn Lloyd out of USC? I'm a truther. There we go. I'm a truther. I might have just watched his tape about two hours ago, but still, I'm a truther. Um, Well, honestly, I forgot who he was uh, because, you know, whenever... These USA, USC games weren't on Pac-12 network, the unreachable Pac-12 network. Then I was trying to watch as much Caleb Williams as I could um, live during the season because as we established last week, I am a recluse sometimes on the weekends, much to the chagrin of people who love me. Uh, <laughs> but, dude, you know, I remember when, when I first started watching uh, – prospects and you know getting to talk to our old pal eric stoner um for mm. marshall and Lloyd for you know about running backs uh you know stoner what i was talking about big backs with balance big backs with balance yep. and it's a pretty good archetype if you're going to be you know an nfl running back who has like a four plus year career um and i think that marshall Lloyd kind of falls right into that and he's the type of running backs that i love watching we're not going to overthink it you're going to run the play as called and you're going to get behind your pads and hurt someone once you get past the line of scrimmage. Um, I, and I, what I love about his tape is Lincoln Riley, you know, he, he's really, I think he's expanded upon what he runs in the run game in college where, you know, when he was at Oklahoma uh, and the like Baker Mayfield was popping off and Kyler Murray was popping off and Jalen Hurts was popping off, they, they were a pretty heavy counter team. But now they still run counter got some inside zone, running outside zone. And Lloyd, he does all of it well. He just doesn't overthink it. You know, we're going to make one cut. We're going to get up the field, north-south, and keep it moving. I I think the only real, you know, the only real big concern as far as, like, his ability to stay on the field that I saw was um, wasn't used a whole lot as a pass catcher in the games that I watched. And I had had a bit of the fumbling bug, too, which we know – NFL coaches are not going to tolerate um, for too long. You know, we just saw basically Desmond Ritter's career end because he couldn't stop turning the ball over last year. And it's just not going to be something that, you know, when the stakes are this high, if you can't hold on to the football, you're just not going to play all that much. But I do think that, you know, if he can get rid of that, he's like the ideal. Yeah, he kind of reminds me of like Gus Edwards in a way. Yeah, you know, yeah, sure. We're just going to get behind the pads. We're going to hurt someone. And then, 
you come off the field and someone else gets to do the flashy stuff. Yeah, but I could see him being that type of guy, like just a bit of a hammerhead, right? I mean, but but that that sounds disrespectful to the type of back we're talking about, because I love your big back with balance, the Eric Stoner note there, because that's 100% the same type of backs that I always really like. These big guys who can stay up and keep it moving and just like push, push, push with the tempo of the run down the field. That's what I like in a running back as well. So this type of guy I do gravitate to. I thought he was a little more boom bust uh, when I watched him, but he's also got injury issues too. In addition to the fun, like an injury, some injury red flags on his profile. He's missed some time. I think he's tore his ACL uh, back in 2020. So there's some reason to be concerned, but he's a guy that I think could end up being, I don't know. I don't want to call him like a post draft sleeper, but like if he goes to the right spot again with all these guys, if he goes to the right spot, if there's opportunity on the depth chart, like I could see him being a guy that, hey, we're, some, watch out for him. And in the same type of way that honestly, like a Damian Pierce was a few years ago, where hey, this is a light depth chart. If he gets out, like I think Damian Pierce is even more boom bust than a than a Marshawn Lloyd type is, but. Again, just watch out for him on this depth chart. If he gets an opportunity, he could end up having a super productive rookie season. Yeah, I'm 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 pretty excited for like the landing spot for him. And I also I I also am excited or interested to see where he gets drafted just because I want to see um how much the NFL kind of values his his skill set. Uh because you know he, he to me, he's got just a classic throwback type yeah. of game that I, I still really enjoy watching, even if it's not like the most coveted skill in the NFL. But like I and it, it, it's funny to say it's because like if I because we just compared him to Gus Edwards, but I would love to get him on the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, mm. You know, have him spell Derrick Henry, and you can run similar types of plays, maybe not to the same degree, because Derrick Henry is like a one-of-one one freak athlete that's still playing good ball as he approaches 30, and, you know, Marshawn Lloyd is more of a, more put in a box as far as his skill sets term uh, uh, determined, but I, I like the idea of, like, if you have a team that can get down and move the ball, get to the red zone, He's kind of a nice finishing piece to have. Uh, and every once in a while, he'll break one himself, but he's usually not really going to be a guy that flies down the field. I was kind of thinking maybe the Rams, um, a team that's looking to run a lot of power, uh, you know, man concepts, gap stuff, uh, blow those holes open for a guy like him, and he can spell Kyron Williams. And, you know, if Kyron misses any time, maybe then you give him a bigger role, sort of like what I think the Zach Evans truthers were envisioning for Zach Evans when he got drafted. But although the Rams really transformed their offense from what we thought they were going to be last year from a run game perspective into more of this gap duo at you type of running scheme. I But I feel like that version of this offense actually would be a really good fit for a guy like Marshawn Lloyd. You drop him in there. You have him spell Kyron Williams. I don't know if you really want to give Kyron Williams all those touches all the time like he got last year. They definitely, to me, need, I think, like a second fiddle at that position. Lloyd could be that guy, develop him. Uh, and the Rams have a ton of picks this year, man. Like they, they have for the, you know, they always have a lot of picks, but they have a first rounder and they have multiple picks on like day two and day three. Not only that, but the Rams, like they are going straight Hulk monster offensive line this year because, Beef. uh, yeah, they signed Jonah Jackson from the Lions, who's going to start at right guard. They re signed Kevin Batson, um, who's another bigger guard, uh, who's going to play left guard. They're moving Steve Avila to center, their second round pick from last year, who played really well left guard and played some center uh, at TCU. Avila will be the heaviest guard or the heaviest center in football, excuse me, at about 330 pounds. So you put a running back who's 5'9, 220, running a 4'4 behind that. I'm a, I, I would, I would like to see that happen. We need to, you know, it, it, you know, I, I was actually talking to my friend Keegan Abdu, who runs, um, the NFL next gen stats and yep basically like you know the trend for this year is the offensive line is getting heavier it's just looking at combine data while defensive players keep getting lighter and lighter and lighter so it's time to reestablish baby it's time to reestablish the run game is dude run game it's is back, back. okay <laughs> it's back so i think i think I don't that's know that a, it, I, I, I don't know if running back contracts are ever coming back but the run game is absolutely back <laughs> yeah well hey Saquon Barkley got paid more than I thought he was going yeah. to get paid, but I think that's more just cap increase than anything. I'm sure they're the back ish. Running back less. contracts are back ish. They're let's back put, because the cap space is up. That's about it, I think. Yeah, hey, man. But still, whatever we can do to get these guys paid, that's fine with me. We need to run people over and hurt people, and I think that Marshawn Moore is good at that. That's the core core basis of football. And the last two guys are kind of on the same same wavelength. 
Well, the Rams are absolutely going to do that uh, going forward. That's for sure. Speaking of the Rams, last guy we're going to talk about here, uh, at least in depth, we'll preview some guys briefly before we get out of here. But Audric Estime out of Notre Dame. Um, this is a guy, 5'11", oh, 221. I've been, I've been mispronouncing his name the whole time. Wow. What do you say? I mean, Esteem? I could be saying it wrong. I don't know. Anyways, <laughs> Audric. <laughs> Audric, 221 pounds out of Notre Dame. Um, runs a four uh, seven one at the NFL scouting combine, Charles. But I say the Rams here because now every after Kyron Williams had the season that he was going to have as like as an unathletic, like at least combine testing wise, unathletic day three draft pick. Everybody's like, well, I, he'll be the, he can just be the next Kyron Williams. He can just be the next Kyron Williams, and he's a Notre Dame back. It all just makes so much sense. But beyond the combine stuff, the athleticism stuff, what is Audric estimate? Uh, as a as a player uh he's kind of baffling to me because i watched him play he was, he was one of the running backs that actually did catch before the combine um and i watched him play and you know he's a, he's a big he's a big back first of all that was breaking off long runs uh maybe not like a fairly routine basis but still showed up that ability so when he came out and ran a four seven at the combine i was a little confused um, and then he ran at the Notre Dame Pro Day last week or the week before. He ran a four five four. I'm like, okay, well, that's probably a little fake. But still, that four five four is closer to what I had in my mind of him as a player, um, because he really was like breaking off some long runs. Now I will say, when you watch him play and he's breaking off some of these long runs, there are some business decisions being made by some of these guys on defense um, because that's a big mm. dude to get in front of uh, a lot of speed to get in front of. And when you're someone who doesn't really have NFL prospects and then you're using your scholarship to go figure out what your, your, your phase two of your life is going to be off the field, you might not want to get in front of a, an uh, Audric Estime and, um, you know, try to make that happen and, and get him on the ground. But still, I, I'm I'm a I'm a pretty big fan of his game. It it, it might be hmm. irresponsible to me, but I just want to throw out the four seven because I've seen him actually get run away from from, from some guys. But I I think it's it's also like irresponsible to not at least consider it a little bit when you're talking about his draft status, uh, which as we've seen, you know, really I guess over the entire you know history of the draft, draft status does have a big uh, impact on how much you touch the ball and how really, really how long your career gets to go. doesn't matter how long, how talented you are. If you're a seventh round pick, you are fighting for your NFL life from day one. So I don't think he's going to fall that far, but the four, seven, two is concerning. I just really like the rest of his game where you're talking about just a big back and get downhill, make people, you know, punish some people. And then I uh, hopefully has some upside in the passing game too. I'm a, I'm a pretty big fan of his game, but I feel like, I'm also kind of giving away the type of running backs I like over the past, you know, couple couple guys we've been talking about. I mean, t- totally. I, I actually kind of liked uh, Lance Zierlein had the comp uh, of Jamal Williams on NFL.com. Like, Ooh. I, and I was I was liked Jamal Williams too. Look, last year with the Saints, not 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 great, but obviously the year before that, he led the NFL in rushing touchdowns. Of course, a lot of that has to do with the Lions ecosystem, but he was another guy that was just reliable. Pretty powerful runner could just get what's there. Um, now he was great in like pass protection, which is why he always played in Green Bay and even early in his career played over Aaron Jones. So I don't know about estimate from like that perspective, but I think that comp actually does make a lot of sense, Jamal Williams. Yeah, it does. And maybe you know uh, he can have a year where he gets to do the infinite money glitch and score a bunch of one yard touchdowns and, <laughs> and get paid by another team. That's like the NFL dream for backs that size. Exactly right. That is the NFL dream. All right, Charles, let's talk just a few more guys here. You know, maybe rapid fire. Jalen Wright out of Tennessee. Um, he obviously came in and had a pretty nice performance at the NFL scouting combine. Uh, that is going to make people excited, of course, because athleticism. Cool. Four, three, eight in the 40 at a pretty good size. 210 pounds. That is going to get people excited. Um, but Maybe not all the way there as a runner. This this strikes me a little bit as like Izzy Abanaconda. Got I was drafted just about by the to Jets say that. Like- <laughs> I was just about to say that. Like because I remember we were talking about him last year, and you're like, "Wow, look at the metrics, look at the size, yeah. the speed, the production. Why is he viewed as a six round pick 
And then you watch him play as a rookie. Like, okay, I get why he was viewed right. as a six-round pick. I totally understand it now. Because uh, as explosive as Izzy was, uh, you know, at Pittsburgh and the amount of success he had there last year, and look, the Jets off to the blind was irredeemably bad yeah. for most of the season. Yeah. Uh, he averaged 3.2 yards a carry. Uh, and on peripheral reference, they have a success rate at 36.4%. Uh, mm. things didn't really go well for him. And I think a lot of that is when you start, like the way we talk about Blake Corum, there's a lot of teach tape that he has. A lot of plays that he has where, you know, I could teach, I, I would use that to teach someone else. I would never do that with the easy tape and the Jalen <laughs> Wright tape too. Like, look, you might be the biggest, fastest guy on the field, but there's a lot of big, fast dudes in the NFL. It's almost right, exclusively right, right. big, fast dudes. So if you can't kind of read a play out and get upfield and uh, have like a really good feel for how plays are supposed to be run, what defense are trying to do, your leverages, people like where they're trying to attack you, different angles, you really you really can't play at all. Um, so you know Jalen Wright, he's going to be an interesting case. Like that's a a draft and stash kind of guy, probably probably more of a day three type of guy. It's funny. I, I hadn't thought about Izzy uh, Israel Abanaconda as the the comp here, but then you just you look at it. Jalen Wright, the last two years uh, at Tennessee, 146 carries, 875 yards, six yards a carry, 10 touchdowns in 2022. This past year, 137 carries, 1,013 yards, (laughs) 7.4 yards per carry, just four touchdowns, though. And then you look at uh, Izzy back at Pitt in 21, 651, 5.3 a carry, seven touchdowns, 1,431 yards, six yards per carry, and 20 touchdowns. Yeah. For Izzy, uh, a Bonaconda there at Pitt, and and that does just kind of line up like the explosive yards per carry. I'm I'm sitting here saying like, look at that forty time, man, that size. But yeah, you're right. Like best case scenario, again, we always try to who's the outlier here, right? Like I think the outlier there is Pacheco, right? A big kind of hammerhead back that's fast. Maybe just the vision's a little wonky with him at times, but that's like the peak of that archetype. And how often does how often do these guys become Pachecos and how often do these guys become uh, Izzy Abanaconda? I mean, you know, he's second season, whatever, but still. Well, yeah, I, I just feel like anytime you talk about the profile, you just you just displayed for us and then you get to uh, why is he not like a top 100 pick? Probably because he's not that good. I don't know. It's more than just um, production. I think Braylon Allen, another guy to mention in that sort of like workout warrior vein, right? He's, um, inter- he, he's really interesting to me. Um, mm-hmm. Because, like, I look at Braylon, look, first of all, I, I would imagine, I haven't looked into, like, Dynasty Twitter too much. I try to stay away. But yeah, good. Not, not Braylon, nice. he was a seven, I remember he was a 17-year-old freshman at yeah. Wisconsin and absolutely just making guys look silly. Um, but, you know, I, I think he's kind of, he, he, to me, he has a ton of upside. One, because of the age. And two, because I just think he's kind of too heavy for his style of play. Um, hmm. He kind of reminds me of where like Le'Veon Bell was when he first got into the NFL, where he, you know he like Le'Veon was like a 245 pound back at Michigan State, and he played like that for his first year in the NFL. Yeah, and it didn't go all that great for him. And then he came back and he was down like 20 pounds, and you kind of get to see like what actually made him such a special runner. And I think that's where Braylon Allen is too. Um, He's he's just kind of slow, and I don't think he has always been that slow. Like being able to watch his career throughout, uh, throughout the uh, throughout his time as Wisconsin. But you know, Collins has dropped a note in here. He doesn't turn twenty one until January twenty twenty five. Like I said Ooh, before, he, he was a seventeen year old freshman carrying the load at Wisconsin, like a Big Ten program. Seventeen going up against Ohio State with NFL players. So like, I think there's clearly a lot of talent here waiting to be mined. Um, but I, I just think he's not in the right body shape for his style of run, even though he's a pretty powerful guy. Um, and the good thing, as we know, as older adults, when you're 20, it's really easy to change your body in whatever direction you want like that. Good so, or bad. Good or bad. <laughs> 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 whatever you want to do at 20, your body can carry that. Okay. Now, now I, I just think he needs to kind of figure out what works best for him and style of, uh, play that he wants to have in the NFL. 
Yeah, he's definitely an interesting one. Uh, he he was a guy who was more productive to start his career, but they also switched up schemes there at Wisconsin. Like, they're not the same old Wisconsin Badgers this past year where it's just like, oh, yeah, Jonathan Taylor, we give the ball to that guy over and over again. All these great offensive lines, power, you know, power, power run type stuff. That, that was not what Wisconsin was last year. So I definitely think that is a guy that could end up being like a deeper sleeper type. And, yeah, he doesn't turn 21 till January 25. That, that age part will get the dynasty folks excited, Charles. We do know that. Uh, any other guys you want to hit on real quick before we get out of here? Is that mostly what people need to know about this class? Um, The only other guy of note to me is like Ray Davis from Kentucky. Mm-hmm. He's interesting to me, too, because he, I remember watching him play. Uh, so for those that are, I'm, I'm a huge Georgia Bulldogs fan. Um, and, you know, I, I still have it in me like where – since they've given me a lot of joy over the past few years, like I will watch like their future opponents, like their games. So I remember Kentucky, they had a game the week before they played Georgia. Um, I don't remember exactly who they're playing, but Ray Davis just went crazy, like running people over, making guys look silly. Um, but he's like 24, I think he'll be 25 during his rookie year. I don't know really what to do with that. Cause I feel like at that age, you should be, be able to do stuff like that if you're still in a college program because you're just you know six to seven years older than some of the guys that you're playing against um so you know you just got to see how that translates at the nfl but he's he's a pretty you know powerful technically sound runner uh and i would imagine he probably gets off the board before like the fifth round and i think will shipley's a guy that like if you needed a receiving back like he could potentially be interesting. So he would be another guy that if he goes to like a good passing game, that's going to maybe need that like, like mismatch guy in the receiving game coming out of the backfield. I think he would at least be mildly interesting there. So honestly, that's really it though, man. So Charles, I think we set the tone right for this running back class, which is we'll see where a lot of these guys end up. Cause I definitely think we gave the people some, some names to be excited about. Like if they land in the right spot, you know, Marshawn Lloyd, Blake Quorum, like there is potential like I, I, I don't want to just come in here and like dump all over this running back class, you know, because there's potential if these guys jump on the right spot, like end in the end up in the right places, they could end up being really good, like steals, right? And and they'd be like, what? Thought this class, this class stunk, but no, these guys can play. Just got to get to the right spot here. Yep, and uh, most importantly, we got to shout out 2012 Randy Moss today. So I would say it's a good pod, very productive podcast. I mean, very productive podcast when we can shout out, uh, you know, Marshall, Virginia, uh, Marshall, Randy Moss. I mean, my God, like we, we yeah, post Titans, Randy Moss, baby. And NFL AJ Jenkins, Mario Manningham got a name <laughs> drop. <laughs> so there we go. Hello, podcast. Charles, always appreciate you. Uh, definitely make sure you're following Charles at four verts. You're keeping up with all his work here on Yahoo. You're listening to the exempt list over on the zero blitz podcast feed. Anything you got working on here, Charles, that the people need to keep an eye out for? Yes. Me and uh, Charles Robinson, we were finishing up our all juice team selections uh, for you know, the week, and they'll be released sometime, you know, in the first or second week of April once we get all the graphics set up. So that's an honor to our former uh, colleague, Therese Paler, who passed away a few years ago. Um, and, you know, it's a good cause for charity to come check out the team, buy a couple of T-shirts, all the proceeds go to. Uh, scholarships in his name at Howard and Mizzou and we'll be dropping the players you know in the next 10 days or so well I can't wait to see who you land on uh, at the running back position after this conversation and definitely the position we're going to talk about next week because Charles will be back we'll be talking wide receivers we're going to do two wide receiver episodes part one part two part one will mostly be focused on the big names but for now that is going to do it for us today we are going to be back on Monday with ESPN's Field Yates for our next installment of Mock Draft Mondays. Until then, we're out.